Hare Krishna. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vardhari Jaya Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vardhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Bhajajana Ranjana <coughs> Yamuna Tiravanachari Yamuna Tiravanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Anjaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Anjaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Mr. Pad Paramahansa, Parujaka Charja, Ashto Tarata Shishi Madhis, Divine Grace, Srila Asi Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Kijai. Iskan Bibiti Foundara Charja Shira Prabhupada Kijai. Jai Mishnu Pad Paramahansa, Parujaka Charja, Ashto Tarata Shishi Madhis, Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakwa Kijai. Ananda Koti Vaishnava Vindaki Jai. Nama Charja Shira Haridas Thakwa Kijai. Gantarachimi Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada's arrival in America ki jai. Samaveda Bhakti Bhinda ki jai. All glory to the assembled devotees. All glory to the assembled devotees. All glory to the assembled devotees. So this being the anniversary, the 55th anniversary, of the Srila Prabhupada's arrival, 1965, I think it was 17th September, something like that. I would like to read the Markani Bhagavad Dharma, which is Srila Prabhupada's poem that he wrote on that occasion. And just describes his nice little introduction here. Okay. Uh, Markani Bhagavad Dharma. It really means Krishna consciousness in America, although we've had it as preaching Krishna consciousness in America, understood. And this maybe can be turned up a little. I think this is the... the Show them how. We have the Vijay levels here. <laughs> yeah, you know, in the evening. That's why you won't wake. There we go. Hare Krishna. Yeah, it's the Q, Q and C. Q or Q and A. What's it called? Hare Krishna. That's good. Perfect. Yeah, that's fine. So, this little intro, intro here. On September 17th, 1965, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada arrived in Boston on board the ship Jaladuta, carrying within his heart the orders of his spiritual master to spread the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu beyond the borders of India throughout the entire world. As he looked out upon the Boston's bleak and dirty sky, skyline, now the thing is, the, the ship docked there temporarily and then went on to New York. So there was some, some time and he, he got off the boat and he w walked a little bit into the city and he's seeing this city now, Boston. The bleak and dirty skyline, he could understand the difficulty of this sacred mission and felt great compassion for the godless people. Thus with perfect humility, he composed this historic prayer in Bengali. 
praying for the deliverance of all fallen souls. So he took a walk, then went back on the boat, got into his cabin, and wrote this. There's another one called The Prayer to Lotus Feet of Krishna. He wrote on the way over, which is a different mood. Oh, oh, at that time is when he sold the set? I thought he sold it on the, on the way over. That's wonderful. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So instead of seven rupees, he had $20. <laughs> Not much difference, really, ultimately. Okay, I won't read the Sengali. I'll just read the English. Now, just to let you know, you know, <laughs> this, um, this wasn't translated until, I think, 1977. Uh, Jai Satyananda, there's a letter and Prabhupada wrote to him and thanked him for his nice translation of this uh, song and, or, pa or, or poem. And he uh, made a few corrections on you know, Jai Sajananda's translation. And he said, I'll also do this for the next one, but he never got around to that. We don't, we don't have a letter. The, the, the prayer to the Lotus Feet of Krishna was never uh, uh, had Prabhupada's input in it. But he liked, uh, he, he liked uh, Jai Sajananda's uh, translations a lot. So. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this youthless soul, but I do, not know, I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me. But I guess you have some business here. Otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? <laughs> Most of the people here are covered by the material modes of ignorance and passion. Absorbed in material life, they think themselves very happy and satisfied, and therefore they have no taste for the transcendental message of, Vasude of Vasudev. I do not know how they will be able to understand it. But I know your causeless mercy can make everything possible because you are the most expert mystic. How will they understand the mellows of devotional service? O oh Lord, I am simply praying for your mercy so that I will be able to convince them about your message. All living entities have become under the control of the illusory energy by your will. And therefore, if you like, by your will, they can also be released from the clutches of illusion. I wish that you may deliver them. Therefore, if you so desire their deliverance, then only will they be able to understand your message. The words of the Srimad Bhagavatam are your incarnation, and if a sober person repeatedly receives them with submissive oral reception, then he will be able to understand your message. And now Srila Prabhupada quotes from the Bhagavatam here. 1, 2, 17, and 21, which he had packed away in his first canto there. I'll just read the translation. Uh, it is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, quote, Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma or super soul in everyone's heart and the benefactor, benefactor of the truthful devotee, cleanses desires for material enjoyment accumulated in the core of the heart of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. By regular attendance and classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering of service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed and loving service unto the personality of Godhead who is praised with transcendental songs is established as an irrevocable fact. Sound familiar? <laughs> it's a verse I chant before every class. As soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes of passion and ignorance, such as lust, desire, and hankering, Disappear from the heart. Can we close that door? Because it's a little noisy. It even comes through the door, out the door. Thank you. Uh, then the devotee is established in, in established in goodness, and he becomes completely happy. Thus established in the mode of unalloyed goodness, the man whose mind has been enlivened by contact with devotional service to the Lord gains positive scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead in the stage of liberation from all material association. Thus the knot in the heart is pierced and all misgivings are cut to pieces. The chain of fruit of activities is terminated when one sees oneself and one's master. Yes, that's the translation. Uh, next verse in the poem. They will become liberated from the influence of the modes of ignorance and passion. And thus all inauspicious things accumulated in the core of the heart will disappear. How will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? I am very unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. Somehow or other, O oh Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. 
Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure as you like. O spiritual master of all the worlds, I can simply repeat your message. So if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. Only by your causeless mercy will my words become pure. I am sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. O oh Lord, I am just like a puppet in your hands. So if you have brought me here to dance, then make me dance, make me dance, O oh Lord, make me dance as you like. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I have been designated as Bhaktivedanta. And now, if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhaktivedanta. This is a prayer we should read every day. It's like <laughs> the perfect uh, expression of humility. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I can understand why. Yeah, very important. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, so let me put this aside. And we move to the Bhagavatam itself. Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavatam. And we are 48. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Okay. On this eighth day of September, 2020 in San Diego, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, translation commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And we are on Canto 4, the creation of the fourth order. Uh, chapter 4, the dis description of the characteristics of King Puranjan, text number... 48. Nalani nalani cha prag Dvaravi katta nirmite Avadut sakastabhyam Vishayam yati saurabham You didn't read this yesterday, did you? You didn't read this. Nalani nalani cha prag Dvarab ekatra nirmite Avadut sakastabhyam Vishayam yati saurabham Nalani nalini cha prag Dvarab ekatra nirmite Avadut sakastabhyam Vishayam yati saurabham Nalini nalini cha prag Dvarabe katra nirmite Avaduta sakastabhyam Vishayam yati saurabham Nalini nalini cha prag Dvarabe katra nirmite Avaduta sakastabhyam Vishayam yati saurabham Nadani nalani cha prag Dvarave katra nirmite Avaduta sakastra bhyam Vishayam yati saurabham Nalini nalini cha prag Dvarave katra nirmite Avadud sakastabhyam Vishayam yati saurabham Nalani nalani cha prag Dvarave katra nirmite Avadud sakastabhyam Vishayam yati saurabham Not yet? Okay. Nalini, of the name Nalini. Nalini, of the name Nalini. Cha, also. Prak, eastern. Dvarao, two gates. 
Ekatra in one place. Niyamite constructed. Avaduta of the name Avaduta. Sakaha with his friend. Tabyam by those two gates. Vishayam place. Yati used to go. Saurabham of the name Saurabha. Translation. Similarly, in the east, there were two sets of gates named Nalini and Nalini, and these were also constructed in one place. Through these gates, the king, accompanied by a friend named Avaduta, used to go to the city of Saurabha. Report. The two gates named Nalini and Nalini are, t are the two nostrils. The living entity enjoys these two gates with the help of different avadutas, or airs, which constitute the breathing process. Through these gates, the living entity goes to the town of Saurabha, or Aroma. In other words, the nostrils, with the help of their friend, the air, enjoy various aromas in the material world. Nalini and Nalini are the pipes of the nostrils, through which one inhales and exhales, enjoying the aroma of sense pleasure. So I'm going to read one more. Mukya nama purastad vas taya pana bahu danao vishayao yati purarad rasagya vipanan vitaha. The fifth gate, situated on the eastern side, was named Mukya, or the uh, chief. Through this gate, accompanied by his friends named Rasagya and Vipana, he used to visit two places named Bahudana and Apana. Purport. The mouth here is described as the chief or the most important gate. The mouth is a very important entrance because one has two functions to conduct with the mouth. One function is eating and the other is speaking. Our eating is done with the friend, with the friend Rasagya, the tongue, which can taste so many different types of foods. The tongue is also used for speaking, and it can speak of either material sense enjoyment or Vedic knowledge. Of course, here material sense enjoyment is stressed. Therefore, the word rasagya is used. Omigyana timurandasya, gyananjana shalakya, chukshu unmiditam mena tasmai shri gurave namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance, but my spiritual master, Sri Prabhupada, opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble basis unto him and all members of Sri Parampara. So this uh, allegory is <laughs> going on in, in a very interesting way. Uh, he's, per he's personalizing all of the different elements that we have, the different um, media by which we can enjoy this world. Uh, and, uh, and so here we, we, we he's dealing here in these two verses with the nostrils and the mouth. Uh, so th so you have to start and kind of accept the, uh, the whole analogy, the main analogy of the city of the body. Right, the city is a big, it's a big city. We're living in the city. We're at Puranjana. We're the person living in the city, Pura, or Pura Puri, like Jagannath Puri. So he's describing the different elements. We're living in this city, and we're able to enjoy the facilities of the city. And he's going through the different elements: the eyes. He, he, he talked about. Now he's talking about the nostrils and the tongue. And when you think about it, it's like that. You know, think about it, I, I was thinking uh, as I was reading this and uh, how little children, you know, they're born and kind of, they don't know anything about anything. Basically, they know when they get hungry, you know, or when something hurts or when mother isn't there. You know, there's some very basic things, you know, but they're not really, they don't really know much about the world. It's a very strange place. And as they grow, they start to get, uh, their legs under them. They, they, you know, they start. They, first of all, they can't even see when they when they when they're born. You know, I, I read about that. It's mentioned about Krishna that when he killed Putana, he, it says he could hardly even see properly. You know, he was that young. I don't know, a few days, four days old, four days old. So why is that? Because when, you know, just just by the, uh, of course, it's not true for Krishna, but for ordinary human beings, it's it's a machine there. And it, the, the retina, or the, the, the lens, turns everything upside down, just like in a camera. It has to be turned right, right up. And so on the retina, everything's upside down. Imagine if suddenly the whole world was upside down. How much trouble you'd have like navigating, right? Uh, 
So the, the mind has to learn how to turn it upside down. It takes a few days before the child can actually see anything. So this is, this is and then you, you, the, the child discovers his body, you know? It's like, a, it's like a discovery thing. And especially there's a whole transition that when he finally gets his legs under him and he can walk, you know? And tell him he's sitting, the mother's watching, keep track of him in the, in the, in the bassinet or in the little uh, cage thing, what do they call that? And, uh, you know, but he's not really ready to walk, you know. But as soon as he gets to, you know, the legs under him, it's a whole different world, right? Now suddenly the parents really have to keep track of him, you know, and because he can run off into the street or run here or right there, you know. <laughs> and I remember, you know, as you grow up, then if you get a bicycle, I mean, that was like a whole transition. When I finally got a bicycle, you remember, then you're mobile, you know. And nowadays th there's, there's also the, uh, the skateboard that they got, you know. So the point I'm making is that the, the living entity kind of discovers, you know, the, all the facilities of the body. And some of them, you can enjoy all this pleasure. The mouth and the, and the, and the nostrils, you know, there's all these nice fragrances and so many other tastes, and, you know. And so that's what we're going through, a little tour here of the city of the body. And uh, all of this that Puranjan is fully enjoying, and he's especially he's got his, his uh, mate there, the queen, uh, although, I, I don't know if we read the verses now where the queen kind of, he becomes kind of a slave. You know, whatever she, whatever she does, he does, because it's intelligence. So your intelligence is really dictating to you, you know, what you're experiencing at any given moment. It's th it feels like you're independent, you're directing your mind here and so forth, but the, in, but the, intelli the intelligence is what you're interacting with, it's described here. So, now how does this relate to us? Well. It, you take, take you know, the analogy or the allegory as a whole. It's a description of conditioned life. It's a description of, of many of the allurements of conditioned life. When you have no, you know, try to take yourself back, because you can't take yourself back. You grew up in a devotee family. But each of us can remember uh, what it's like. We have, you have no reference to this philosophy. You're just living, you know, an ordinary life and with this philosophy of life or something, you know, but basically it's... A, a life of the senses, and there's some pains involved, and it's uh, there's really no no um, philosophy behind it, you know, th anything that's really governing you. You're just going along, pretty much as everyone else is going along, and that's what Puranjan is. That that's what this is showing. Without this uh, access to a transcendental knowledge, which can teach us our real situation which is what the Bhagavatam is teaching us through this, and of course all the other instruction in the Bhagavatam. Uh, we're, we're really helpless. We're, we're, we're prisoners, you know, conditioned soul. Without that knowledge, what do we have? We're blind, you know. All we can do really is respond to the inputs that are coming. And, and just as Lord, as, as Pallad said so eloquently, Matthyuna Krishna Padataksvatova Mito Vipadditi Grihavatanam Adanta Gobe Vishatam to Misram, Punak Manashtravita Charvananam. He describes it so wonderfully there. That one who, he, here he's describing, he's talking to his father. You know, just, just look at, you know, pick up on the scene. Here's this fragile little boy, five years old, and this monstrous demon who's conquered the whole universe, you know. And he's speaking the absolute truth to him. He's not flinching at all, speaking truth to power. This is a, you know, a dangerous thing to do. But he ha he's, com he's completely fearless because he ha he's completely with Krishna. So he's saying, he's saying basically, Father, don't worry, you'll never become Krishna conscious. <laughs> Mati na Krishna. Mati is the mind. So we're trying to put our mind on Krishna, right? But here he says, Mati na Krishna. Though the, the, the persons he's just going to uh, describe here, they can never fix their mind on Krishna. They don't want to, and even if they wanted to in their present mentality, they couldn't unless they wanted to go through tra transformation. So what is the situation? Uh, first of all, they can't place it by their own efforts, by others' efforts, or meeting in conferences, he, he says. But mito griha batan. Griha batana means those who have taken a vow to enjoy materialistic family life. Right? It's like this is their focus and their, you know, and it's true of practically everybody in the world. Uh, and the senses are out of control because it, that's what materialistic household life is or materialistic life in general. Somehow satisfying the senses includes the subtle senses, the mind, you know, and all these things. Planning for sense gratification. 
you know, becoming envious because you don't have this sense gratification. It, that's all. The, that's the lodestar, you know. Uh, Adanta gob here, and this, in, this, in this mentality, the senses are out of control. You're not. They're they're, they're controlling you. Vishatam tamisram, you enter more and more into darkness, means ignorance. And then this immortal line, which is worth memorizing, it's easy to understand. Punak punas charvit the charvananam. Again and again, chewing the chewed. In other words, in this life or previous life, you've already experienced some other variety of sex life, some other taste, some other intoxication, all of these things. But now, it, 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 that's, all you, that's all you know, and so you're trying to enjoy the same thing again or it was slightly varied. varied. And just becoming more and more entangled. So those persons, he says, Vishnu. They have no idea that they're svarta. This is a very important word, svarta. It means the, the, the actual goal of your soul. Uh, Sva means you, yourself. Not your body, but your soul. Uh, the word shreya is, is similar. Uttama shreya. Uh, what does it say? Uh, the, the ultimate good. You know, the summum bonum. The summum bonum means the ultimate good, actually. Uh, that they're completely ignorant of. And so instead of the swa-arta, they're after bahirarta, the external goods, pleasing the senses as we're witnessing here. How can, where's the next aroma? Where's the next taste? You know, this, I, I mean, I grew up in New York City, and I, I, we didn't have the money. I, I didn't really grow up in New York City. We grew up on Long Island. But I was aware of all of the fancy restaurants in New York. You know, very expensive French restaurants, this restaurant, that restaurant, so much... You know, for what? For pleasing his tongue, rasagya, rasagya. Uh, when I read this verse, I, I, I thought of two words from a verse that I had completely forgotten. Rasagya, rasagyam. This is a name uh, or description of Radharani. She, her tongue is expert at tasting the rasa of glorifying Krishna. So she's not rasagya, rasagyam, you know. But this is, the, the ordinary tongue, is rasag, it knows taste. Rasagya, you see? So that can be an extremely a, a powerful element of conditioning. You get uh, accustomed to, to eating a certain thing, and chances are, you know, it's some abominable food stuff. And that's just your diet. You know, Badrin Ramaj would explain some of the horrific things that people leave. He would travel all over the world, you know, selling paintings. And, you know, you go to this place, and there. What was that, where they, 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 they get dead animals and then just leave them to rot in one place and then there's a liquid in there that they put on it, that's a gourmet thing. Burma, you know. I mean, how, it's just, I mean, devotees just cringe at, you know, how could anyone like that, you know. But I mean, many of us can go back, I know I can, go back when my diet, you know. I always like to tell when I remember when, when McDonald's started back in 65 or 4 or 3, something like that, I was... I would go bowling every Friday night with my friends, and suddenly, uh, right where we bowl, right next to it, is a is McDonald's place. I said, oh, this is great. We can eat before or after, you know. Just as abominable as anything else. You know, because you don't know, you're in ignorance. So, so the, the tongue and, and, and other senses, we're talking about the nostrils of the tongue, they get conditioned to uh, enjoy a certain kind of fragrance, a certain kind of uh, food, you know, that can just take you straight to hell, you know. And you have no idea. It's just what we do. We grew up in this culture. That's what we eat. So, uh, th this, is, this is the city we live in. You know? But with the knowledge, you know, Prahlad says, uh, they, they, uh, manina. and uh, what is it? Durashya. You can't actually achieve happiness this way. Durashya means a, a, an aspiration that is never to be achieved. And that is happiness through sense gratification. You know, you, you can achieve some fleeting pleasure that way, but the, but the end result of that is like a million times more, you know, worse than the pleasure itself. The pleasure is this little thing. But you're going to hell for a million years for eating meat. You see the difference? <laughs> I mean, when you, when you, when you know, the, know the philosophy, and especially when you've, you know, purified your senses and you're just taking prasadam, you know, you can see how you can be so thankful to the all the Acharyas, Srila Prabhupada especially, for giving us this knowledge to save us from this, this horrible fate. So, uh, the, and the, the problem is andayatandayatupandiyamana, is that it's the blind leading the blind. You grow up, you're, you're born in a family, completely helpless, your parents are just ordinary people, 
and they start feeding you, you know, okay, maybe there's a little breastfeeding at first, but then the formula, you know, and they, there's meat in it, and there's all kinds of things, and you're just accustomed. You're conditioned. This is conditioning. So, andayatanda uh, upinimana, and everybody stays bound up. The, the, the elders and the youngers, those are bound up by the, tightly by the ropes of, of the modes of nature. So, the Bhagavatam and all its teachings, this is a very uh, poignant analogy, or allegory, excuse me, uh, is, is giving us a, uh, a, a visualization of our own condition. We're in this city, and if we don't have real knowledge, then we're going to seek those fragrances through the nalini nalini and through the mukya, the main, you know, we're going to be enjoying so much taste, and also, you know, kukata, kukata, not Krishna kata, Kukata destroys your intelligence and throws you down into hell. There's a verse like that. So th the whole uh, uh, saving grace of human life is the ability to get knowledge, intelligence, strength in the intelligence from the pure source and then redirect your senses. Use them in a proper way. Now the, the mouth can be used as a great liberating force when we're actually tasting prasadam and we're speaking Krishna Kata. That's that's the, the actual uh, situation of of the the mouth, which is so important uh, in Krishna consciousness, hearing and chanting. Right, the chanting is done with the tongue and the mouth. So, as as uh, everything else we we find out here, uh, it's all in the question of the consciousness, your intent. You know, there's so many buildings here in in, in Pacific Beach. This particular building, you know, is made of the same materials materially. But it has a completely different purpose and a completely different con uh, gives you a completely different consciousness when you enter into it and you actually participate. Right? We don't. I mean, I don't feel like I'm in, you know, Pacific Beach or America or even the material world when you really take advantage of this building, and you realize everything here is meant for the glorification of Krishna, service of Krishna, Radha and Krishna. Right. And that's what, and, and, it, and it affects anyone who walks in here, what to speak of devotees who seriously take advantage of it. So, th so this is Krishna's uh, mercy on us. Lord Chaitanya's mercy, Krishna has Lord Chaitanya as well. Uh, giving us the process by which with these very senses, by which we're conditioned and which we can become more conditioned, uh, they become our source of liberation. The body becomes spiritualized when we use it to connect to Krishna. And, and the process, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita tells us how to do that, you know. And chapter 6 is kind of the, <laughs> you know, I love those, those, those uh, lectures, you know, the uh, yoga systems, the yoga system tapes, it's my favorite. We made a book out of it. And uh, Prabhupada, you know, there's so much good instruction in there, don't eat too much, don't eat too little, you know. And fix the mind on me. I mean, this is all Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada gives also, of course, the purports and Krishna conscious purpose to it, the Gaudiya Vaishnava purpose. But in the end, that process is not for us. You know, uh, the dhyana yoga, the ashtanga yoga process. You know, but there's there are there are uh, relative aspects of that of that process in in everything we do. The yama niyama. You know, the don'ts and the do's. You know, Sharanagati, uh, accepting things favorable, rejecting things unfavorable. Yama niyama, the don'ts comes first. You really have to stop doing all your nonsense before you begin. <laughs> you stop, you know, so we got the four regs, and we got the Chan Hare, Chan Hare Krishna 16 rounds, you know. Uh, the regs and the rounds, you know, that's, that's the basic minimum. But th those take you a long way, and, and opens up the door to everything else. So, so then when you begin chapter 7, you know, Krishna is speaking that for us. He says, oh, okay, I understand. You can't do dhyana yoga. You don't have to. Because the greatest yogi is one who fixes his mind on me, and that's what I'm going to now teach you, basically bhakti yoga. And he begins where we're at. This is a great mercy. You know? Okay, you're in the material world, right? You're surrounded by solid matter, air, water, light. Is it, right? Earth, water, fire, air. You understand space. You have a mind. Everyone knows they have a mind. So these are the things we're going to work with. You know, I am those things. Those are my energies. And your interaction with them, right? Rasoham, Apsukonte, the same rasa, rasagya. The taste in water, when you drink water, think of me. Prabhupada preaching in the storefront. 
you know, about this. And he says, okay, even the, the drunkards, you know, when they drink their wine, if they can remember Krishna, then they'll one day become a great devotee. <laughs> so the idea is that, that through knowledge, suddenly your whole being in the world, your experience of the world changes. This isn't just water, you see? This is, this is Krishna's energy. Oh, how kind he is to give me a drink of water. I was thinking of that because I was hearing the lecture and I was, wow, you know, breathing is, at least on my mind, more than before because of uh, COVID, right? People realize, oh yeah, I've taken it for granted. I can't take it. But just, you know, when you take a deep breath, how thankful we should be. Krishna is providing that air for us to breathe, right? So there, if you can remember Krishna with gratitude. That's a, that's a, a good position. You see? And everything else, the light of the sun, the water, you know, all of this is, is, is God's gift to us. So this is the first step in God realization. And it changes your attitude, everything, to being in the world. So this, uh, you know, rather than, you know, kind of <laughs> cruising in the world, you know, what can I enjoy? What can I exploit? You know, this is like many people's idea. Completely uh, not aware of God or even caring if there is a God. You know, there's, there's such a wonderful field here, you know. And the electronics, you know, I don't even have to go outside. I can live through the, the screen. I can have all these adventures. It's sick, you know, and it produces kind of madness ultimately. But that's, a, that, that's what modern uh, technology does. It, it, it creates an ability to, to ratchet up the experiences uh, of, of ordinary senses. But as we learn very quickly, if we do that, that uh, you suffer tremendously. The more that you try to extremely enjoy the senses, the more the reaction is. This is why, you know, the, the, there's a plague of drugs. There has been for a long time, and today it's not getting any better, you know. And people are at their wit's end. There's, there's lockdown, you know, the usual av avenues of enjoyment, and there's, there's a pall of fear over everything, of death, you know. And then, there, then there's this kind of madness of, well, who cares? Let's enjoy anyway. You know, and I have parties yesterday, you know, and and then there's a br there's an outbreak and people get sick. You know, this is a, this is a uh, example of material life. He says, "Well, I don't care if there's a god or not. You know, I'm going to try to enjoy it as much as possible." You know, and you get slammed down. It'd be the 16th chapter. So we're we're very fortunate to have. Uh, come in touch with this knowledge, Srila Prabhupada's mercy. You read that, you know, the, the today is, 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 we should really contemplate, you know, Prabhupada's courage, his, his compassion in coming to America. And you can see he was faced with, you know, this first Boston skyline, and then he's going to go to New York, which is even more overwhelming. And uh, somehow or other, you know, he just persisted. This was, this was you know, our great fortune. You know, he would even go back to the, uh, to the, um, uh, the boat, the, the ship, shipping uh, office, you know. And uh, yeah, he had a return ticket any time he wanted it. And one time he kept coming and said, well, I notice you never actually get on the boat. You just come here. <laughs> but he was, you know, he, you, read, you read those early letters or, you know, lectures even. And Prabhupada said, yeah, I'm planning to stay a few months, you know, in America. <laughs> but after... <laughs> almost a year, you know, he was still persistent and Krishna just showered his mercy on him and everything grew from that. So that's a great lesson for us. And this attitude of this prayer, we, it, it can be read by every devotee every day. To feel oneself helpless in this world, and to, and, but, to, but to accept the mission, I'm going to be Krishna conscious, I'm going to try to give Krishna conscious to others, this is the best use I can make of my life, you know. But I'm completely unworthy to do it. So Krishna, if you if you want me to do that, please empower me to speak properly and do what I need to do. And that's the attitude, you know. And and when he sees that it's sincere, then he empowers us, you know. Even to do anything, you know, here we have to be empowered, you know, to be able to to stay and and keep coming and chanting Hare Krishna. It's not a given at any time. I mean, and those of us who've been around for a while, we've seen. You know, devotees uh, who, who, you know, were fixed up, but somehow or other, they let themselves, you know, they're slack in their uh, sadhana or whatever. And they, uh, they weren't able to continue, at least not right away, you know. Many, many come back eventually, and, you know, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. So the, the prayerful attitude is so important, as Prabhupada so wonderfully exemplified. 
I said, well, who are we? You know, what am I? But by Krishna's grace, by the grace of the Guru and all the Vaishnavs, um, I'll be able, you know, maybe I'll, if, if I'm fortunate, I'll be given the strength to practice this process and help others to, to come. That's the yeah, idea understand. So we come back down to 8.30, and I'm going to read this, uh, these two translations again, if there's any comments or questions. Similarly, so similarly means similarly the, to the eyes, the eyes of the first. Now, similarly to that, in the east, there were two sets of gates named Nalini and Nalini. And these were also constructed in one place, the nostrils. Through these gates, the king, accompanied by a friend named Avaduta, used to go to the city of Soroba. So the wind is blowing the different fragrances. The fifth gate, situated on the eastern side, was named Mukya, or the chief. Through this gate, accompanied by his friends named Rasagya and Vipina, he used to visit two places named Bahudana and Apana. I'm not sure what those mean. But Any comments, questions? On I'm sorry? Okay. Oh, we have the mic. Go ahead. You know what that means? Yeah, I, I, have to l I would have to look it up. I looked it up, and you know, when when the baby is born, immediately they can see. Oh, really? Yeah, but, it's but they just down. can't see too far, but they can see, yeah. That's the puppies. The puppies don't see. Dogs, they don't take so long. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, I didn't say they couldn't see, but yeah. I, but the thing is, I, I what I've read is that it's upside down on the retina, and they have to learn how to, you know, the mind has to learn. Well, I just said that it says that they can they could see for like about a foot. They could see clearly for, for about a foot. Oh, okay. All right, I was wrong about that. Yeah. All right. Anything else? <laughs> okay. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. I guess all I have to, what they really need to do is be able to see the mother's breast, then everything is good. <laughs>